Kane Feingold in cyberspace. How much should bloggers on the internet be regulated? Um, we work. We host this event in conjunction with the Internet Caucus and its co-chairs, Senators Conrad Burns, Patrick Leahy, Congressman Goodlatte and Boucher, and Wireless Chair uh, Congressman Honda. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our moderator, Michael Cornfield, consultant for Pew Internet and American Life Project. Um, he's an adjunct professor at the George Washington University School, Graduate School of Political Management. He also wrote a book, Politics Moves Online, as well as he writes a monthly column for campaigns and elections. Um, he's going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. It'll be followed by a short uh, panel discussion, and then we'll have an audience question and answer session. So I'll go ahead and introduce Michael Cornfield. Thank you, Danielle, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me briefly introduce my co-panelists, then I'll have a introductory statement to sort of put this discussion in what I hope will be an intelligent context. Then I'm going to ask the panelists to talk for about five minutes each. Then I'll ha open up the discussion with a couple of questions and then we will very rapidly open it up to um, our audience. And I hope we will have a microphone by that time. Uh, in the event that we do not, I may reserve the right to paraphrase your questions so that everyone watching on television and listening through podcasts and whatever other technologies we're going to be using today uh, will be able to follow the dialogue. Uh, to my immediate left is Scott Thomas, who is chairman of the Federal Election Commission. To his left, in the center, insert joke here, is Mike Krimpaski of redstate.org, who is also the co-founder of the online coalition uh, and maintains rathergate.com, not specter.com, and confirmthem.com, in addition to his uh, anchor website, I believe, redstate.org. And on the uh, extreme left of the panel is John Morris, who is the director of CD, uh, the Center of Te for Te Democracy and Technology's Internet Standards, Technology, and Policy Project. Very well, then. We discussed today a topic in which most, if not all, of the key terms are loaded with multiple meanings, which are sometimes contradictory and sometimes controversial. Any regulatory or legislative action that may be taken as a result of the revision process the D.C. District Court has ordered with respect to the Internet and campaign finance will have to set out definitions of these key terms. Officials, campaigners, journalists, and citizens will struggle to understand these definitions, and lawyers will charge high fees to purport to explain them. Welcome to a semantic midway. Here's the public communication hall of mirrors. There's the media exemption merry-go-round. And down at the end of the midway are the threshold throw-up rides. The biggest hubbub seems to be around the blogger tent. <coughs> And if we get into a discussion of the word blog, what is a blog, we may not get any further. So let me start instead uh, and orient my remarks around the term mainstream media. It's a term that bloggers are fond of using when they are putting themselves in a her heroic light. Sometimes it's abbreviated as MSM. The MSM, or mainstream media, has become a punching bag term for old or mass media organizations which distribute content via television, radio, newspapers, and magazines. For some reason, movies and music belong to a different category which is known as Hollywood. The mainstream media connotes conventional wisdom, liberal bias, corporate control, irrational bureaucracy, sensationalist drivel, and endlessly repeated oversimplifications. Well, sure enough. But guess what? The mainstream media use the Internet, too. And Internet user numbers have reached mainstream proportions. According to our latest Pew Internet and American Life Project survey completed 10 days ago on March 21st, there are now 136 million Americans who use the Internet. Excuse me, adults who use the Internet. That's 67 percent, two out of every three Americans above the age of 18. By the way, in the 12 to 17 year old age group, 87 percent of them use the Internet. 
There are another 13 million adults who do not use the Internet but live in a household with an Internet connection. Of that 136 million in the adult U.S. online population, just over half, about 75 million, turned to the Internet in the 2004 campaign cycle. The numbers I cite now come from a March report on the campaign uh, and the Internet, uh, which is available at pewinternet.org. Of that 75 million who use the Internet with, in connection to the campaign, uh, 63 million used it to obtain news and information. That's an 83 percent increase from the 34 million who used it in 2000. 63 million people is a mainstream audience if ever there was one. Demographically, this online audience continues to take on more characteristics of the general adult population. There are more women. In fact, the gap between women and men has closed completely with respect to Internet use. There are more older Americans. There are more rural residents. There are more English-speaking Hispanics. There are more African Americans. There are more middle and lower income households who have joined the early adopters. So the population using the Internet is mainstreaming in that sense of the term. As a primary news source, the Internet still trails television by a wide margin. Television is still the main medium people use to follow the campaigns and elections. But the Internet has closed the gap on radio and newspapers, especially for the 27 percent of the U.S. population who have broadband, high-speed, high-volume connections to the Internet. The websites of major news organizations attracted the most members of the online politics audience. Online portals such as AOL and Yahoo, which mainly repackage mainstream news, were the second most popular source. But now the application of the term mainstream media to the Internet starts to get a little wobbly because the Internet audience encounters a broader range of campaign relevant information than just news as journalists define it and ads as politicians pay for them. 34 million Internet users sought candidate positions on issues at specialized websites such as candidate websites or websites maintained by parties or advocacy groups. 31 million looked up, followed opinion polls. 14 million looked for information on how to register to vote and where to vote. 32 million looked at jokes. 19 million looked at video clips. And we have no number on how many people looked at rumors and fabrications with respect to the campaigns, but we do know that 25 million Americans told us that they checked the accuracy of claims made by or about the candidates on the Internet. So in effect, tens of millions of Americans in 2004 used the Internet to assemble their own voter guides. Millions of Americans also bumped into political news and information while browsing the web or looking for other types of information. In fact, over 30 million, fully half of the 63 million did that. Now, there's another sense in which the term mainstream media, while it applies in some respects to the Internet, does not apply to the Internet. Because on the Internet, unique among the mainstream media, <coughs> information moves upstream as well as downstream. In fact, it also moves outwards into a wetlands, which may need special protection because it constitutes that most precious of social environments, a public space. Let's turn to email. More than 43 million Americans said they participated in an email conversation about the 2004 elections. That 43 million overlaps with the 63 million in the audience, but not entirely. There were some Americans who didn't use the Internet to go get news and information, but exchanged emails about the election. And email can be casual. It can also be very intentional. Uh, friends and colleagues can connect. A campaign representative can enter the email dialogue, and suddenly a member of a mainstream audience can be turned into an activist. Can email carry ads? Of course it can. Can email be sent for a price? Of course it can. Can email be co coordinated with campaigns? Of course it can. 
So email as well as websites are implicated in our definitions of what constitutes the Internet with respect to campaign finance laws and regulations. 14% of the entire U.S. adult population got political email between Labor Day and Election Day. That's a lot. Now, it's not as much as got direct mail. Half of America got direct mail about the election in September and October of 2004, and 40% got telephone calls. But those numbers will change and they will blur. Already, Americans exchange email at nine times the volume of postal mail. And perhaps you've heard of VOIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol. So email, like the use of the web, is going to become more and more political as the years go by. A final introductory point. At a time of sharp and rising dissatisfaction with the mainstream media in its coverage and treatment of politics, the Internet stands out as a plus on both a social and a personal level. By a 10 to 1 margin, 49% to 5%, the Internet users we interviewed judged the Internet to be a positive addition to public debate on the 2004 campaign. The remainder said it made little difference or didn't know. 70% of the online political news and information consumers said they found what they were looking for about the campaigns always or most of the time. Now, can you imagine comparable numbers of satisfaction for television or for newspapers or for direct mail? I don't think so. The Internet today, at least, is the good medium for politics, which is not to say there are not problems with it. There are, and we will get to them. But our best guess is, right now, the Internet as a medium for politics is not broken. And so I'm going to ask Chairman Thomas to explain to us why his commission has been obligated to fix it. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> well, thank you for uh, having me here. I um, will read uh, a little bit of my talking points outline just because I want to make sure I get it said correctly. But I suppose at the outset I would just want to uh, note that the uh, – Federal Election Commission is your commission. It is uh, designed to try to make the campaign finance laws that uh, Congress has passed uh, work and work effectively. Um, so what we're trying to do as commissioners and as a body is to try to pull together all of the various uh, existing statutory provisions that are on the books and try to uh, basically fit Internet technology into those, uh, those rules. Uh, and we are going to discover, I think, that it's not easy. I think uh, we are looking forward to the proceeding that we are undertaking because it will help us learn a lot, and it will help, I think, people out there learn a lot about uh, how these laws fit together. Um, but basically uh, what we're talking about right now, the immediate concern, is this Internet rulemaking that the Commission has undertaken. I would just say uh, for people who are, first of all, interested in how can they be heard, uh, we are uh, now guessing that the uh, actual notice of proposed rulemaking is go going to be uh, published at the Federal Register on uh, April 4th, and uh, we have built in a 60-day comment period from that publication date, so uh, people will have roughly till June 3rd to submit any comments that they might have about that notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, that rulemaking is designed to address uh, mostly a court's ruling that the Commission's current blanket exemption in the party soft money and coordination rules for everything Internet related is simply too broad. Uh, the court, in essence, said that the statutory term, quote, public communication, end quote, which includes any form of general public political advertising, had to be read to include at least some forms of Internet activity. In the coordinated communication context, the court said that the Commission's blanket exemption, quote, severely undermines FICA's purposes, end quote. Um, fairly strong message. The Internet, uh, we must all acknowledge, is not always a cost-free political tool. Um, reports are kind of hard to come by, but there have been reports indicating that somewhere between $15 million and $25 million was spent for Internet-related political advertising in 2004. 
It also has been reported that this form of, of advertising is growing much faster than other traditional forms. Uh, so there is the potential for so-called big money to get involved in political advertising on the Internet. Now, the FEC has put out for comment a notice of proposed rulemaking that continues to broadly exempt Internet communications from the party soft money and coordination rules that depend on that public communication definition. <coughs> the only change suggested here is to treat as a public communication Internet advertising where one person pays to place such advertising on another person's website. This is designed to reach the most obvious situations where significant money could be involved. Now, the proposal as written would not affect the content that a state or local party puts on its own website, so parties could continue to treat website costs as an overhead expense. Uh, it would not treat as a coordinated communication whatever a, an individual, a business, a union, or a blogger, whether incorporated or not, puts on its own website. It would not treat it as a coordinated communication what individuals or bloggers send or receive via email. And placing a link to a candidate or party committee's website would not be a coordinated communication. Now, the proposal that we have put out for comment also uh, addresses the disclaimer requirements in existing law. And it actually relaxes the current rules. Um, under the existing rules, an individual, a blogger, or any other person that sends unsolicited email with express advocacy or a federal contribution solicitation to over 500 recipients must indicate who paid for the communication and whether it was authorized by any federal candidate. Now, the term unsolicited uh, currently means that the recipients have given no prior indication that they uh, want to receive email from the sender. In essence, list serve situations where persons have given authorization for inclusion on the list escape this unsolicited test. However, my angry Aunt Betty's email to a list of 501 like-minded friends might be deemed unsolicited email that falls under the disclaimer requirement. So, under the draft proposal that's out there for comment, the Commission would redefine unsolicited to cover only situations where the sender has paid some third party for the list of recipients. This would mean individuals, bloggers, and other organizations sending emails won't have to worry about disclaimer rules if the list of recipients has been developed without paying for it, for example, by a uh, person simply joining the organization's list to serve. This change is designed to require disclaimers only in what could be described as political spam. Political spam, situations where valuable lists are purchased by the sender to spread and express advocacy or solicitation message broadly. Um, the proposal we're putting out also seeks to, in essence, relax the rules that relate to individuals acting independently and without compensation uh, to use their home or publicly accessible computers to expressly advocate for or against candidates. Um, the statute and the commission's rulings have long recognized the ability of individuals acting as volunteers uh, for a candidate or party to do this. Uh, but with regard to independent activity, there had been some indication that the Commission didn't feel there was a legal allowance. So this proposed regulation we're putting out for comment would exempt independent express advocacy using computer technology the same way uh, that providing volunteer support to a candidate or party is now exempted. Um, in this uh, Notice we also are out there seeking comment on the media exemption that uh, Michael referred to, and uh, we are asking folks to help us try to sort out how you would define who would be entitled and should be entitled to that media exemption. Um, we are hopeful that uh, these kinds of issues will generate helpful comment. We urge everyone out there to give us your thoughts. Um, if you're just itching to get going and don't want to wait for the uh, publication in the Federal Register on April 4th, you could go to the FEC's website right now and you could look at the agenda document which serves as the basis for that notice which will be published and you could start reading the kinds of areas where we are uh, interested in seeking comment. We hope that uh, people will uh, uh, express uh, careful legal analysis first. Uh, as I've noted, we're dealing with lots of legal terms that uh, 
have to be sorted out. And uh, we understand there might be some uh, uh, rage lurking beneath the surface uh, for lots of folks interested in this rulemaking. Uh, but first and foremost, we need your help in terms of giving us uh, careful thought about how these legal terms actually can be applied in a way that uh, will uh, allow the core provisions of the campaign finance laws to remain intact, but at the same time will allow our citizenry uh, full freedom to go ahead and express their views in the campaign process. Thank you, Ch Scott. Um, if you could... Uh indicate when the 60-day clock starts with respect to a public comment. Well, if this is published on uh, April 4th, uh, that would be the date that the clock would start. Okay. Thank you. Mike Krampatsky. Well, first, thank you to the Internet Advisory Caucus for uh, not only holding this panel, but certainly inviting me to participate. And thank you to my co-panelists for not objecting to allowing a rabble-rouser uh, who doesn't really hold a lot of official standing uh, to be here. Uh, I guess I would like to start with a disclaimer, since they seem pretty popular uh, in Washington. Uh, that is that I'm here to represent redstate.org and the online coalition, which is a bipartisan group of, of bloggers and online professionals concerned about this rulemaking, and certainly not my employer. My second disclaimer is that I am not an attorney. And so I hope that gives me uh, the opportunity to share <clears throat> at least just a little bit about what it's like to really explore and attempt to explore uh, this rulemaking process and these regulations, and it really hopefully informs uh, my position that I hope that no blogger ever has to do that again. Um, and, and let me say that I understand that the FEC is in a tough spot. Uh, they're obligated to comply with a court order, and while my personal preference would have been for the Commission to appeal that court order, uh, that time has certainly passed, and the real question is, where do we go from here and how do we produce something that works? Um, I don't think that the rules are necessarily as clear as Chairman Thomas laid out <coughs> in terms of who would be protected and who would be exempted. Um, I believe it does present some significant challenges and problems for people that want to be active online as well as people that are simply consider themselves online journalists. And I really don't think it's unfair to raise the, the notion that part of the problem with this rulemaking process is that there isn't a real good understanding of how politics on the Internet works at the Federal Election Commission. And that's not to say that they're uh, ignoring anything or, or, I mean, that's not what they do. And if you need any evidence, I think two examples, one being at the public hearing last week, Commissioner Danny McDonald almost boasting to the crowd in the room that, Quote, no one in this room knows less about the Internet than I do, end quote. And these sorts of comments are the kind of things that give bloggers a lot of pause because these are the folks that are charged with regulating us. And secondly, and I sort of hate to bring this up, uh, uh, Chairman Thomas himself on March 10th or 11th, rather, at a conference called Politics Online, decided to describe uh, the broad cross-section of bloggers as, quote, Billy Blogger in his basement wearing a Lyndon LaRouche t-shirt, end quote. And with all due respect, I don't think that's the case. I've certainly never met anyone that supported Lyndon LaRouche. Um, <clears throat> and I certainly don't own any of his t-shirts. Um, I think the truth here is that bloggers really represent a broad and deep cross-section of America. They're experts, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're mechanics, they're scientists, they're artists, they're musicians, they're school teachers, and blogging is simply their <laughs> hobby. But collectively, uh, when you put them together, they really represent something that's truly extraordinary. And in fact, I, I would even go a little farther to say that bloggers are really no different than the pamphleteers uh, that were present around the founding of this country. Uh, people using their own time, their own money, uh, and what meager means of communication they had to get their opinions out there, largely to question authority. Um, I really do look forward to discussing the, the specifics of this rule and how I think that the FEC can improve them, but I was advised that whenever you speak, you should try to find some sort of historical example or story to try to illustrate your point. And so I'd like to just close my opening remarks with this, and that is that I believe the FEC is really poised to repeat a mistake that's almost 350 years old. Um, which sounds a bit odd, but in July of 1665, about a 1,000 people had died from the bubonic plague in London. 
and responding to rumors that the plague was carried by cats and dogs, the Lord Mayor of London ordered them all destroyed. 200,000 cats and 50,000 dogs later, well, we know what happened. We know that the Lord Mayor was wrong, that it was not cats and dogs that were the problem, it was rats. And the only thing that the Lord Mayor did in his attempt to fix the problem was to remove all of the natural predators from the rat population. So we can wonder how much damage did the Lord Mayor do? And the reason I think it's relevant is that if your concern is the undue influence of big money or special interests or misleading or sham ads and communications, then frankly, bloggers are your best friends. They're not the enemy. They're not part of the problem. The blogosphere is fiercely independent. It's suspicious of authority. It's suspicious of money. And frankly, it's more effective than <coughs> any regulation could be at exposing these connections and fact-checking uh, the so-called authorities that try to buy or uh, throw their influence around on the Internet. Certainly, they delight in fact-checking. I think that would be fair to say. Um, in just hours, bloggers, unpaid bloggers, volunteer bloggers, very motivated bloggers, unraveled a major broadcast news story that, uh, um, you know, took five years to put together. After one of the presidential debates, bloggers on the opposite side of the political aisle, in about 15 minutes, uh, debunked something that uh, the vice president said. Uh, this is a good thing. And I would plead with not only the commission, but those that uh, support this rulemaking in general and those that will be weighing in on this rulemaking in general, please don't kill the dogs nor the cats. Thank you, Mike. John? Well, thanks very much um, for inviting me. Um, I mean, let me say, I, I, I want to start out by making the same point that Mike just finished with, but I'm afraid I can't possibly top the 350-year-old rat analogy. But um, I, CDT has, has, dating back to the um, late 90s when the FEC first really started looking at the Internet, um, we've been an advocate of, of keeping a deregulatory approach to um, online political speech be because I mean, we fundamentally don't view the Internet as part of the problem. We view the Internet as part of the solution to um, many of the concerns raised by the campaign finance laws. I mean, you know, our perception is that, is that underlying those laws are fears that big money um, can buy political influence and fears that big money can drown out small speakers. Um, and we see the Internet as helping to address those problems directly. Um, the Internet has radically broadened the sources of political news for Americans, and it, it enables millions of small speakers to express their political views in ways that just were completely impossible um, a few short years ago. So although we don't argue that online speech um, cannot flatly be regulated, we, we do think that it's a, it's a critical thing that any rules that the FEC um, finalizes and promulgates must ensure that small speakers can express their political views online and can do so without hiring a lawyer. Um, I mean, just as Mike just said, I, the, the rules are very, very complicated. It's very difficult to know what you can do in this in a particular situation. And, and so I, I'm hopeful through the process we can move to some simpler and easier to understand rules. And let me say that we, we applaud the FEC for the cautious approach that they have um, started out in and headed, headed in in their notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, by focusing the NPRM on situations where money actually changes hands, I, they, they've gone a great distance to, to limit the, the, the reach and the scope of, of what they're doing. And, and we're, we really do appreciate those efforts. But having said that, we have very serious con continuing concerns about the potential harmful impact that the new regulations will have on online political speech. And, and our concerns are really rooted in kind of three almost fundamental um, points about, about the campaign finance laws and how those laws map onto the Internet. And first, the Internet is, is really, we think, a, a fundamentally different medium from most other forms of mass communication so that the very theory of the campaign finance law 
doesn't really map well. Um, with broadcast, cable, newspapers, billboards, the general assumption is that you have to spend a fair amount of money to be able to communicate um, to a large audience. And, and um, that is obviously you know, quite different than, than the internet. Um, in, in contrast to you know, the thousands or tens of, tens of thousands of dollars that it costs to, to place an ad on TV, um, y we measure the cost of individual internet ads in pennies. And, and so the, the, the assumptions that a paid political ad is inherently means big money simply doesn't necessarily translate over to the internet. So, so we need to simultaneously figure out a way to, to, to be concerned about the massive expenditure of money, but still not prohibit small expenditures of money. Um, so secondly, I, we, we, as has already been mentioned, we're, we're very concerned about the concept of the news media and, and how, how the traditional concept of the media will translate um, onto the internet. I mean, it, w we perceive that the, you know, there's kind of an implicit assumption that the news media is a, is a relatively well-defined, relatively small group of organizations and some individuals. Um, but, you know, on the internet, a as we know, there are thousands or tens of thousands of sources of, of information. And many of those sources are, are run by individuals or very small groups that are run by small speakers, just precisely the kind of um, speaker that, that I think we're trying to promote and trying to facilitate um, their ability to speak. So I mean, here again, we need to be sure that the regulations don't um, have the opposite effect of our goal and don't end up discouraging the small speakers from, from being able to speak. Um, and, and third, I mean, let, let me say that you know, I appreciate that the, 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 the task of applying the campaign finance laws um, to the internet is like trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole, and the FEC is is trying hard to do the right thing. But I'm very concerned that, that the efforts today and the efforts that you see in the NPRM um, and the questions that the Commission raised are trying to accommodate political speech in today's internet, but are going to fail to accommodate political speech in tomorrow's internet. Because we can't sit here right now and imagine the forms of, and modes of speech that are going to be available to us in five years or in ten years. A and, and by focusing only, say, on blogging, and perhaps even putting blogging in some special reserve place, we may well be um, you know, making some other form harder. And in fact, what's the bigger concern is that we may even discourage the development of the other form of communication. In other words, if blogging has a special place or if we define a certain type of communication that's okay, that's regulation free, but someone has a slightly different idea, we might discourage the, the, in the development of that idea. So I, we feel it's very important that the rules that are applied to the internet leave a, a very wide berth for innovation and new models of political speech. And l l let me close by saying that I, mean, I, I believe, as, as I think Chairman Thomas already said, that the, the FEC um, already knows very well that it doesn't fully understand the Internet. And, and, and I, I heard at the meeting last week, um, I heard a, a number of essentially requests or pleas to the Internet community to um, help the FEC work through these, these very difficult um, factual questions about how this all will play out in the Internet space. And, and, and so, I mean, I, I don't want to suggest that the, that the Commission is not trying to address the very concerns that I'm raising. Um, CDT is already working with a broad coalition of organizations to try to identify some of these possible potential impacts. And, and we look forward to working with the Commission and working with, really, I think, a broad range of stakeholders to see if there are ways that we can both pursue and, and fulfill the goals of campaign finance reform, but still allow a, a broad range of speech to go on the Internet. Thank you, John. Um, I want to start by asking Mike um, a question about his definition of bloggers. 
Um, you, you characterized bloggers as pamphleteers, as, as gadflies operating in the best <coughs> tradition of, of um, independent thinking and independent action, and I, there's certainly a lot of evidence to support that. Um, another definition of a blogger is anybody who uses blogging software as a platform uh, to express uh, ideas on, on, on the World Wide Web. So a corporation can be a blogger, a union can be a blogger. Um, bloggers may accept money. Um, uh, are they required to disclose it if they accept money uh, from campaigns, as was the case uh, in, in South Dakota Senate race last year? Um, if bloggers spend money to advertise themselves and to get people to link to their blog, as George Soros did uh, with his blog last year, um, should they be made to conform to the uh, campaign finance laws, or does the definition of a blogger as an independent speaker trump the, the um, similarities to uh, uh, other forms of, of expression which are regulated if they were to do those sorts of things? Get your comments on that. Well, first let me say that I absolutely agree that it's, it's a very difficult thing to define a blogger. Uh, you know, even saying what bloggers think or what they do or how they act is sort of trying to describe, you know, broadly what Protestants believe. Um, there's such a wide range of different people that are, are there for different reasons that believe either slightly or widely divergent things. But I think the key here is that we ought to look at the element within that broad de definition that has the most virtue and the most value and be concerned about that. And if the price is that we let someone get away with, you know, advertising their own blog on another blog, uh, then maybe that's something we have to evaluate. Um, I would say that you, to answer one specific part of your question in terms of, uh, I think you brought up the South Dakota blog, and for those that don't know, there were two people in South Dakota that ran a very <coughs> effective blog, effective in terms of how many people paid attention, certainly uh, it, was, it was widely credited as being an effective tool, uh, to write about the South Dakota Senate race. Uh, the campaign, at the same, one of the candidates in the campaign also paid uh, two of the bloggers, uh, presumably as consultants or, or some other role. That I don't think that that's necessarily clear on the campaign. And so the question comes up, does a blogger have to disclose when he's paid by a campaign? And frankly, I think that question is moot. Uh, a campaign is already required, presumably. That's how we found out about this, uh, to report those expenditures to those bloggers. And frankly, if we do go to the point where we're requiring bloggers to disclose uh, who paid them. Now my impression is, again, I, I don't understand all of the regulations, but I would say that that's actually a higher burden than almost anybody uh, faces in terms of election reporting and, and requirements. Uh, this actually came up in the hearing, I believe, uh, when Commissioner Mason raised this point, and I think, Chairman Thomas, you actually amended the, the rule uh, to reflect asking the question whether or not the FEC even had the authority to do it. Um, so I don't think you can really define a blogger per se, and I think that's absolutely the challenge that this rulemaking faces, uh, because how do you cr create a definition that simply doesn't exist for anyone to claim that asks for it? And so no, I don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I think that uh, within that broad whatever, um, there's enough there that's of positive value to our politics. Do either of you have any comments on this subject? Well, I I think uh, it's it's interesting. I think uh, Mike has already demonstrated that, like Commissioner McDonald, he knows a lot more about something than he's actually letting on. <laughs> um, Commissioner McDonald, first of all, he's a he's a very clever man, and he's an old Southern style politician. So when he says he doesn't know anything, and then five minutes later he's proved that he knows more than you, you know what he really meant. But um, <laughs> Mike uh, has displayed a, a pretty good understanding of the underlying law. Um, this situation of a candidate campaign paying some blogger. Uh, to maybe have the blogger put out some nice content of some sort um, is is something where it's true. The candidate campaign under the existing campaign finance disclosure rules is going to have to disclose that payment made to that blogger the way they disclose payments to any other vendor. Um, the disclaimer rules currently, uh, as we have crafted them, uh, wouldn't require that blogger uh, communication 
uh, to in turn have some sort of disclaimer. Um, right now, the disclaimer rule only attaches uh, when uh, a campaign uh, is, has its own website. It has to put a disclaimer on its own website indicating that this is uh, a website paid for by the candidate campaign and indicating that it's so authorized. Uh, and then there's this email rule I told you about that deals with uh, unsolicited communications to more than 500 people, but that wouldn't attach to the, uh, the blogger in question. So under the current rules, um, there's, there's not a way to reach that uh, blogger who has received some sort of payment in terms of uh, dealing with that as some sort of uh, disclosure obligation on the part of the blogger. Um, I suppose at some point, in some case, uh, someone might be able to say, well, wait a minute, this is not just any old blogger. Uh, this is a blogger that's been bought and paid for and is totally controlled by the candidate campaign, and the blogger's own website should be considered uh, de facto the, as being the candidate's blo uh, website, and hence there should be a disclaimer under the existing rule for candidate websites. But, you know, that's a, that's a pretty hard uh, uh, road a hoe, and I don't think that the, that fits the the facts that we're talking about there. But uh, I think uh, Mike has sort of laid out the the basic uh, underlying legal situation we find ourselves in, and in terms of what we're proposing in the rulemaking, uh, the bottom line is we're not proposing any change, any additional disclaimer requirement to be imposed uh, uh, on the blogger um, in that set of circumstances. We're putting out for comment whether or not. Somehow, some way, there might be a legal authority that someone could construct to, f to require some sort of disclaimer. But uh, as, as I think uh, Mike noted at the meeting, I expressed some doubt about that, that ability to get there legally. If I could, let me just add two points, almost contradictory points in terms of the, the concerns that I'm going to express. First off, in the, as I understand the South, South Dakota situation, um, there was a disclosure made, but I believe it was made after the election itself, and so, um, you know, the, the impact of those blogs was already, had already occurred. Um, but even though I just expressed a concern about the lack of disclosure there, let me express um, some concern because I do believe that the notice of proposed rulemaking um, does raise um, some real potential problems on the disclosure area, um, not in the, you know, the paid blogger context, but by, by redefining public communications, you, you make a situation where um, a, a, a small paid ad, paid by you know five or ten dollars, which which is certainly a possible within a, within the internet context today, um, might the, a small paid ad that expressly advocates you know vote for jo Joe, um, is going to require a disclaimer under the current set of rules um, once we redefine if we redefine public communication to include internet communications, and that ad. Will may well require an, a small speaker to disclose their home address in the in the ad, or you know, there's some context if the ad is just a banner ad, it's not even clear that that a disclaimer really would work. So I, I just want to just flag to say that flag the issue to say that, um, that I think we're going to have to work through some of the disclaimer, the, the implications on in terms of disclaimers um, that arise from the NPRM. Let me turn to another vexing aspect of uh, the potential regulations, and that's um, the thresholds of spending. And uh, there, there are several thresholds. Let me concentrate on the $250 threshold, at which point uh, certain, certain disclosure um, uh, requirements uh, kick into play. Uh, the information economy is very volatile. Um, something that is priced at $249.99 today could be worth ten times that by the time the next election rolls around. Conversely, it could be worth one-tenth of that, um, a, a sponsored link on, on a search engine, um, uh, a, uh, an ad that is put on uh, uh, instant messaging. Um, uh, there, there are numerous examples. If the thresholds are to, to be reasonable, shouldn't they be indexed to something? Or shouldn't they be reviewed every four years so that we're not stuck with one threshold level for 20 to 30 years? Yes. Thank you. 
<laughs> Anyone Actually, else want to go? I, I would just also add, uh, interestingly, the Commission every year has asked for legislative recommendations, and uh, we have actually just gone through the process of making legislative recommendations uh, to Congress. And one of the ones that we've included there for several years now is that Congress ought to take a look at the underlying uh, reporting registration thresholds. Um, and uh, this, is, this, this would fit right in with that because some of these really have been the same since the, the, the central provisions of the <coughs> campaign finance laws that we're now working with were passed. And this was back to 1975 time frame. So, so what are the options? One is, one is to sort of peg it to the inflation rate. Another is to float it and review it on a regular basis, which... It... Sure, those would be two viable options. Um, we have uh, seen in, when Congress uh, recently changed the law in BICRA, they did build in uh, inflation adjustments for the contribution limits in most circumstances. And we just went through the process of increasing the contribution limits, for example, according to the, the uh, inflation since BICRA was passed. And so now an individual, for example, can give $2,100 per election to a federal candidate and so on. So this would be something where Congress, if they wanted to take that up, they could take a look at that, that $250 threshold that exists for some individual out there who incurs expenses to put out an express advocacy communication. Um, as if they cross that $250 threshold right now, they are obligated to put out, to file with the FEC some sort of independent expenditure report uh, that shows uh, how much they've spent for that communication and not which candidate it is uh, designed to uh, support or oppose and so on. So um, it can be a relatively low threshold. Um, in, in the context of Internet, uh, you know, we uh, several years ago got into it a little bit in an advisory opinion context, and uh, we were struggling trying to figure out, well, what sort of costs should this person who's uh, putting out this Internet-based communication count toward the $250 threshold? And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the proposals we've got in this notice that we put out to, for comment is to, at least in the independent activity area, uh, sort of extend the same sort of freedoms that now exist for volunteers who are actually volunteering in, in coordination with the candidate. And that would free those kinds of circumstances from the worries of try trying to calculate whether some individual doing an independent expenditure has crossed that $250 threshold. If I could just ask one question then, because the way I read the, the the proposed rule, it really sort of creates two possible safe havens for bloggers that want to be active. One is the volunteer exception. The other, obviously, is the media exception that you discuss and talk about. And in a volunteer circumstance, uh, there's a mention in the, in the explanation about a volunteer being allowed to spend a nominal amount of money or a nominal expense in the course of providing service as a volunteer to a campaign. And I wonder if there's anything that you can tell us in terms of the background of whether it's FEC it has already sort of determined what nominal means. Well, I think uh, the way the volunteer exemption uh, has, has worked and the way it's designed in the statute, it's, it's sort of an allowance that allows you to use whatever um, properties, your personal properties you have at your residence or use uh, a, a, the community center where you're uh, uh, connected to where you live, things like that, regardless of amount. So there isn't really a dollar amount built in in terms of what you could say is the dollar value of, say, using your home computer, uh, getting the software you need for your home computer, uh, things like that. There's no dollar limit involved. So I think the concept we're, we're contemplating in this proposed rulemaking would be similar in the independent area, the independent expenditure area. Because one of the reasons I ask is that it's, it's very conceivable that if I don't like my local congressman and I want to start a blog to tell everybody why I don't like my local congressman and his upcoming race, I'm going to start a website. It's going to be relatively inexpensive to start, and I might pay anywhere from 0 to 5 to 10 to $25 a month and over the course of a year, uh, we're, we're talking something that I don't think the FEC has ever sort of described five or six hundred dollars as a nominal expense, specifically just to have this opportunity to talk about uh, this congressman that person X doesn't like. So that was one of my <laughs> big questions, and I just don't know if there's anything you can tell us more about sort of these terms that we see like nominal. Well. I'll have to go back and take a peek at that, but uh, I wasn't, uh, as I understand the way the exemption worked, it doesn't have a, a dollar allowance, and, and the concept of nominal wouldn't re really uh, play into it. But, but if I could, let me, let me complicate the question and, and, and just in another instance show how... Commissioner McDonald, when I need him. <laughs> 
show, show, show how the internet, you know, how the internet is different. In in, in most forms of mass communication, um, I have a very clear idea before I initiate the communication how much it's going to cost me. I mean, I you know, I call up the newspaper and they tell me it's going to cost me X to take out a a, a full page ad. But you could easily imagine a situation where. Um, a local congressional race. I, I happen to think, you know, one one of the um, candidates is a buffoon. And let's just imagine um, a, a couple months before the election, only going to be up for you know for a couple months. I I make with my little camcorder um, a, a, a funny 20-second little video that makes fun of uh, of this guy, and I stick it up on my website, which only costs me ten dollars a month. Um, well, only costs me ten dollars a month most of the time, um, and, and so you know. That that's cost me, I don't know what it's cost me, it's cost me $150 to do that. And I think, fine, no problem, I'm, I'm, I'm under every threshold I can see. And then, four days before the election, Mike here goes and blogs my website. <laughs> and people all over the country are downloading my video. And five days after the election, I get a bill from my ISP for 500 bucks of bandwidth. Because all of a sudden I had a really, you know, and so comp I, I didn't intend to spend $250. I didn't intend to spend, you know, I, I'm not really even happy that Mike blogged my, my video. <laughs> I don't really have the 500 bucks. Um, um, but, I mean, you have that, that's a situation where it, it, the, the Internet just works a little differently. And we just got to figure out how to accommodate that kind of situation. Oh, I agree. It is. It's the kind of thing. It's perfect if you can point that out when you file your comments with us. That uh, that is one wrinkle that you have where you may not actually be able to control the cost element. Let me turn to the audience right now and see if there are anyone any questions. There's a microphone. If if you could go to the microphone and state your name and any affiliation you care to, and then uh, ask the question. Uh, Michael Basick. I am a co-founder of Online Coalition with Mike Krampaski. Um I do have a question for Chairman Thomas. First of all, thank you again for, for coming here and for soliciting comments uh, in such an open forum. Uh, the question would be, with uh, respect to the media exemption, uh, the proposed rules mention specifically sites like Slate, Salon, and the Drudge Report should receive the media exemption, but then went on to say, what should we do about blogs? And I'm just curious to know what criteria you think you uh, will use in the future to determine what other sites like Slate and Salon deserve the media exemption. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's too early for me to cite which criteria <laughs> I think uh, I personally would uh, use. We have in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking laid out a long string site of advisory opinions where we have grappled with whether in particular circumstances some particular uh, set of facts warrants application of the media exemption. And we hope that that sort of gives people really the best guidance possible about how the Commission has used different circumstances to uh, go one way or the other about application of the media exemption. Um, you, you can, you can from, from those, you get uh, generally some rough sense that um, if something is going to fit within uh, the media exemption, it's going to have to be, as the statute says, something uh, that's being uh, sent out through the facilities of a broadcasting station or a newspaper or a magazine or a periodical publication. Um, now, those are the statutory terms we've got to work with, and so uh, we'll have to work with that. In, in one not too uh, distant advisory opinion, we got into it uh, about whether or not this uh, 501c3 group, I believe it was, Citizens United, uh, should somehow get the benefit of the media exemption for some documentaries or a particular documentary that it was proposing to put out. And we looked at the circumstances there. And to us, we didn't see uh, some sort of track record that they were uh, a periodical publication. Uh, and so that was kind of the, 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 the cutting line there. But um, you, the, the main point I would urge people that are paying attention to this rulemaking to focus on is um, there are lots and lots of Internet-related uh, forms of communication. And Obviously, a lot of them are blogs that are putting out commentary, and it's, it's obviously very helpful to the political process, but 
um, the Commission would be well served to get all sorts of comment about the different kinds of circumstances that these um, blogging entities uh, find themselves in. Some may be corporations, some may not. Some may have uh, a standard practice of paying for their operations using advertising revenue or using subscriptions. Others may just have a few background investors or supporters. Um, um, some may be set up as 527 organizations. That's the provision of the tax code that uh, uh, deals with organizations that are willing to concede they are a, quote, political organization whose primary purpose for the most part is influencing elections. So those kinds of distinctions uh, would, I think, be important for people out there commenting to, to help us see and help us understand so we can develop the right kinds of criteria. Would anyone else on the panel like to speak to this question? I, I, I actually would. I think that um, I've tried to read some of the, the media exemptions in terms of determining if there's a common thread of, of what sort of gets you that exemption and what doesn't. And I wasn't able to do that, but I did have a question, uh, specifically when you mentioned sort of what circumstances do arise. One thing that bloggers do very, very well is raise money. They are very, very good at building a community of people online and then rallying around a particular candidate or, or party and that sort of thing. Uh, I think as Glenn Reynolds mentioned at a conference a few weeks ago, they're not really good at convincing people of anything really. They're very good at motivating the already convinced. And so my question is, has the FEC ever allowed the media exemption for one of these entities that through the use of news, commentary, or editorial, has made a direct solicitation for funds for a federal election. Because the example I would use is a New York Times editorial that you could cut off the bottom and mail it to John Kerry with a check, um, you know, having a reply device built right in, because that's, in fact, what many, many bloggers do. Well, and if I could, even before you <coughs> respond, let me again further complicate the, the the question. I mean, we look at we look at the the existing rules um, for what a news media organization is, and and one of the elements of them is that a news media organization. Um, it, the, the situation is that as, as part of a general pattern of campaign-related news um, that give reasonably equal coverage to all opposing candidates in the circulation or listening area. Well, there are at least two problems with that. I mean, one, I'm, I'm not sure that, say, redstate.org would, would qualify as giving um, reasonably equal coverage to all opposing candidates. Um, but then two, what's my listening area? I mean, you know, it, 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 my listening area is the entire country or the entire world. So, I mean, there, there are just some yet more complications. Yeah, I think that this is really, I think, this is the first time since I've been at the Commission, and I've been there quite a while, where I can remember the Commission really throwing out there uh, for comment some sort of uh, opportunity to help us mold uh, this definition of uh, what can qualify for the media exemption. And so... <laughs> I anticipate that there will be some very constructive comment about, well, this is what you said in one of these old advisory opinions. It seemed to be relevant back then, but look how it applies in the Internet context. It doesn't make sense anymore. So, uh, you know, I, I, I want to uh, assure people we're keeping a very open mind about this. Uh, with regard to the solicitation question, whether or not we've ever dealt with a, an entity that uh, was claiming media status but at the same time might have been involved with soliciting a contribution, off the top of my head, I'm not recalling anything. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the immediate exemption does allow the New York Times, um, CBS, any of the so-called traditional media to uh, put out an actual um, editorial endorsing a particular candidate. So I can't see how including in the solicitation something, or in the editorial something that says um, this person should be voted for and uh, this person should be supported financially. I can't see a big distinction there, to be honest, if, if an organization is otherwise going to fit within the media exemption. My name is Mark Harris. I actually uh, run a blog, uh, SaveTheGOP.com, and I had a question about that's going to be more concrete. Um, basically, we're six college kids from across the country that run this blog that advocates for conservative politicians uh, within the Republican Party. Um, and we write stories about them that could be considered sort of news stories, but also endorsements and solicit for volunteers and things like that. 
Um, and obviously, we don't have the type of money to hire a lawyer to tell us what we can and can't do, how we need to incorporate, you know, those sort of questions. And my question is how concretely, because I think this is an example of what you are going to run into the most, is these type of um, basically overtly political blogs, um, how these, this rulemaking device is going to apply to someone who clearly is advocating expressly for a politician and isn't really, I mean, serving, I wouldn't say a um, news organization role, it's more a political advocacy um, role. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Obviously, at this stage, I can't say I have any particular answers. The, uh, we are um, we're often confronted with uh, a, a difficult um, question when we're trying to figure out uh, what kinds of organizations actually sort of cross over into the definition of being a political committee under the campaign finance laws. Um, uh, and this is an area that where the Commission recently went through a rulemaking, and uh, I can see that there are lots of groans amongst the FEC uh, folks who are sitting in the audience because <laughs> it was uh, a long and difficult process to try to, to deal with that uh, particular construct. But uh, for the most part, I think that what, what is contemplated in this particular rulemaking is um, trying to get any comment the, even on that question, I mean, if that is your concern, that you have an overtly political entity that seems to be focusing all of its efforts, efforts on getting out a partisan message, um, the point would be, you know, does something, does a practice like that somehow mean that the organization cannot get the media exemption, or does it mean that uh, an organization under those circumstances somehow should not be entitled to this otherwise broad exemption we're building in for internet activity unless it involves some sort of paid advertising purchased on someone else's website. I mean, as, as I understand it from what you're describing, most likely the, the Commission would be able to work the internet aspects of what you do into this broad exemption that we're talking about. But, you know, it's the kind of thing, these things always are interesting because there are lots of facts that go behind any particular hypothetical and um, you know, it's, it's one thing to sort of say, we're, we're working, we're functioning entirely as uh, uh, like a school newspaper, if you will, comprised of volunteers and we're just putting out content and it's very much like a school newspaper. On the other hand, you might have something where you've got a group of folks where it's actually being utilized by some so-called big money supporters who are realizing that this is a real popular website and uh, the whole function here is uh, indistinguishable from a standard political committee that, that has to report to the commission. So help us draw the lines. Great question. If, if I could just add one thing. When Red State was actually founded last July, uh, we were active in the election and talked a lot about politics and encouraged people to give money. And, and we realized that if we looked at the way the campaign finance laws were actually written, that there was some real danger there to people like us. So we actually... Uh, are a political committee. We're a registered political committee and a 527 uh, with the IRS, which basically forced us to do two things. One, it forced us to give up about $20,000 a year in very small advertising revenue uh, based on the traffic of our blog. We had to give that up and turn it off. And two, we actually had to go out then and raise enough money to pay a lawyer to not only get us incorporated in Virginia, but file with the FEC, um, uh, help us fill out our first round of reports, which I might add were four days late. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, just in the very simple way that the rules are written, we felt that, you know, just to make sure that we sort of protected ourselves, that we would actually do this. And, and that sort of does lead to one other thing, and that is that, you know, in this particular rulemaking, Red State, for instance, doesn't really have a dog in the race because we're not really, if we're already doing all this regulatory stuff. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think the I think the question is a real one. Uh, what happens when you go from four people by themselves, or in a college dorm, to four people that are in a college dorm, and now the website's bringing in fifty dollars a month in advertising? Uh, what happens when? Uh, I think the the biggest concern right now is what happens when your small group of people decides, or by yourself you decide, that frankly the prospect of being sued by a corporation, or whether it's Apple or the New York Times 
really makes the whole idea of incorporating really attractive just to protect yourself from liability. Uh, does that put you in a different category when it comes to the FEC? Are you now a, uh, a corporation that, at least on paper, doesn't look any different than GM? We, we've spent a lot of time, thank you. We've spent a lot of time talking about bloggers and websites. Let's talk a little bit more about email. There's a, there's a proposal uh, which you made reference to, was it your Aunt Betty? Or um, that, that anyone who sends out email to more than 500 addresses purchased from a third party are subject to regulation. Um, I'd like to hear um, all of the panelists' reactions to the regulation of, of email. Uh, I understand that this is somewhat of a um, mirror isotope to, to the franking privilege, uh, uh, and it's an attempt to control uh, political spam, but, but to me this raises all sorts of questions about first whether or not political spam belongs in the same category as commercial spam. Uh, you could argue that, that what seems like spam uh, to the recipient is, is someone exercising their, their constitutional right to, to talk about things and, and maybe as members of a free society um, we ought to receive what some might call political spam. Second of all, um, uh, what sort of <coughs> compliance would, would a group of people who decide to send out a bunch of email um, uh, have to consider? Suppose they, there are ten people a acting uh, in, in concert and each of them sends out fifty emails. Um, third, uh, the definition uh, applies to email that is substantially similar. Well, what if I customize the emails? What what is substantially similar mean? Um, what if I send it out from I'm one person sending out 500 emails, but I use 10 different computers? How are you going to catch me? Um, this provision seems to me fraught with um, problems of constitutional uh, definition, and also from a practical level, um, how are you ever going to enforce it when we get to email? Because email is much more dispersed uh, than, than um, uh, websites and, and, and bloggers. So comments from anyone on, on that topic? I've talked mostly. Why don't you guys start? Sure. I'll start to say that, that I, mean, I, think you, I think, Mike, you raise a, a very, very important a whole nother hornet's nest of, of, of issues and problems. Um, I mean, I, I think constitutionally, uh, there really is a, a, a significant question, or um, in, my, in my mind, it's a it's a, almost a, a clear conclusion that commercial email, commercial spam, um, can constitutionally be regulated more more heavily than political speech. Being political speech, being um, some of these speech that we value in this country um, most highly under the First Amendment, and and. You know, although I appreciate the the desire to to kind of end spam, I, I I'm not sure that the FEC is the the right agency to try to do that um, that task. And, and, and let me just po posit a, a, a hypothetical where, I mean, it's, it's hypothetical we've actually posited to the Federal Trade Commission in, in spam-related proceedings there um, of where you, know, you have a situation where, um, you know, middle of the day on Friday you learn that your town council is going to vote Monday morning on something that you consider to be horrendous and and you you feel that it is important enough that that you get out and reach out and talk to um, every citizen in your town. Well, right now you can walk around and stick a flyer on everybody's front door and successfully accomplish that. Why can't you go out and spend a hundred bucks to get a list of everyone in my town that has an email address and send it out to them? I mean, so th th there are obviously competing concerns here, and and you know the the use of of mass mail by a campaign you know may well raise different implications but i just want to again you know come back to the point i keep harping on that that rules that might make sense in some context might not make sense when we're talking about a lone speaker trying to reach out to um, his or her neighbors for example well i, th I think that's all true i think the other uh, when you mentioned the definition of substantially similar. Uh, I think that one thing we've seen as email becomes more sophisticated is that the less similar your email is, the more s effective it is. Um, so just by definition, if, if you use the, uh, I, th I think Mike mentioned earlier, sort of the inter Internet of Tomorrow or 
or, or, or next year, uh, is that, you know, in terms of being able to, to, to collate and collect personal information and, and, and then use it in communication, I think that the, the notion of, of email not being personalized or tailored, uh, whether it's to your specific interests or uh, the last campaign event you went to uh, or just your name in the subject line, uh, I think that uh, that term, I, I think, is, is, is already obsolete. Before I go back to the questions, let me make two brief self-serving comments. One is one of my colleagues at the Pew Internet and American Life Project, Deborah Fallows, has been studying spam for several years and we have found, she has found, um, that the American public does make a distinction between political spam and commercial spam and they, they object to political spam but not in the same proportions as they object to commercial spam. So there is public appreciation for this difference which we have documented. The second thing I wanted to mention is that we are embarking on a big survey of bloggers and this survey will be administered online through our website so if you are a blogger and would like to add to public knowledge of who bloggers are, how they see the world, how they finance themselves, um, what sort of influence they have, please visit our website and it's right there on the home page is um, uh, take our blogger survey. Now, back to the question. Oh, you, but sure. I just before we leave that topic on email, um, sure. I, I do want to note it's important that uh, um, um, discussion about FEC may be trying to end political spam. That's not on the table. What's on the table is just this disclaimer issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a question of whether or not, in some circumstances, broadly distributed email somehow has to have a disclaimer that says who paid for it and, and whether it was authorized. So uh, we're not about uh, trying to in some fashion uh, end spam, political spam. It's just a question of sort of accountability and, and the disclaimer rules for, for a long time have required uh, some sort of uh, disclaimer even on very inexpensive uh, communication. The flyers uh, that John alluded to that are put on windshields, um, again if it's uh, widely enough distributed uh, that would also have to have a, a disclaimer. So uh, that's what it's about. Well I, that's a very important uh, clarification. Thank you for adding that. Sir. How have the uh, defenders and lovers of the First Amendment been weighing in? Have you heard from lawyers like uh, Floyd Abrams or Kenneth Starr? I take it that's directed to the chairman. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyone. Not, not, <laughs> what we have heard from. <laughs> well, the, the comment period hasn't technically even started, but uh, I'm sure we're going to get lots of comments from lots of uh, uh, high-powered lawyers because a lot of the uh, lawyers who are knowledgeable in this area uh, are going to be representing um, some of the, the groups that have, I think, uh, a lot at stake in this. But um, I hope we hear from them. They're always uh, very uh, entertaining. I had, I, I enjoyed very much watching them argue in the the McCain-Feingold uh, uh, battle in the courts, uh, known as McConnell versus FEC. They were all very able, and uh, it was. Uh, I would love to have their participation. Well, and let me just add, just as, as a lawyer who specializes in First Amendment um, law, I mean, I, I think there really is a, a very um, broad concern already um, among a, a wide variety of groups, both online groups and offline groups, about the implications of, of the NPRM. So I, I'm fairly certain there will be um, a very broad participation in the rulemaking process. One of the definitions uh, that the Internet is blurring in all our lives, not just in politics, is the definition between home and work. Um, a lot of us work at home, a lot of us do home things and, and private things at work. And I know that there's a term of art in your world called the home volunteer. And I wondered if you could explain that and talk about um, uh, what, what the FEC is contemplating, uh, uh, how to reconcile home volunteer with the blurring of, of home and work with respect to computers and, and, and life. Um, I didn't mention it, but one of the uh, additional issues on which we're seeking comment is how to apply our longstanding uh, regulations that relate to uh, the ability of an individual undertaking volunteer activity while at the workplace to use the facilities of the uh, employing 
entity. For example, if you, if you work at a corporation or you work at a labor organization, uh, we've got regulations that basically say uh, if you're acting as an individual volunteer, you can make occasional or isolated or incidental use of the organization's facilities in order to undertake your volunteer activity. And, and only if there's some uh, increase in overhead would you have to reimburse the organization. Uh, so the example we always use in our teaching workshops is um, if you want to use the photocopy machine to print up a bunch of flyers, uh, you basically uh, would have to reimburse the organization for the cost of the additional paper, but uh, you wouldn't have to go out and go beyond that and sort of figure out some proportional uh, co amount of the monthly service or rental fee for use of that machine. So uh, we've got rules in place like that, and what we're doing in this uh, internet related rulemaking is, uh, first of all, uh, we're suggesting uh, to clarify that that rule I talked about, the occasional isolated incidental use of a corporation or union's facilities rule, would apply to using the organization's computer equipment as well, not just the fax machine or the copy machine. So that's one thing we want to deal with. But the, the, the reality is we're finding ourselves somewhat uh, um, constrained, if you will, by the existing prohibition that's in the statute. Uh, the the, the pr prohibition for years has been that a corporation or labor organization is not to make any contribution whatever uh, to a, a federal candidate in connection with a federal election. And the statute goes on and defines the term contribution very broadly. It includes basically a, a payment or, uh, or, uh, or anything of value that's provided in connection with an election. So in theory, anything of value can be pretty darn small. Now, we built this uh, exception into the regulations many years ago, and so far no one has uh, thrown it out as, as being too kind an exemption to corporations and unions. Uh, but this rulemaking is getting into that, uh, that area. And um, uh, one of my commissioner colleagues, uh, Michael Toner, was very interested early on in trying to uh, clarify that uh, the, the, the volunteer exemption we talked about earlier, which, as I mentioned, relates to use of home uh, personal property, like your computer at your, at your home, uh, is also uh, expanded, if you will, to reach situations where uh, you may not have your own computer, but you can go to the library and use a publicly available computer. Um, so we're sort of trying to expand out in that area as well. But at least in that area, what we have in mind is it's not really an occasional isolated or incidental test. It's not a nominal cost test. It's any use of those kinds of computer uh, services in that context uh, will be an, an exemption. So that's the, that's the sort of the framework we're working with, and we hope we can get valuable comment there. Is, are those distinctions goofy? Uh, can we do better? Let us know. Well, I guess I would, my first question would be, if I'm someone who could potentially run afoul of these things, uh, what do you tell me when I ask how much is incidental, isolated, or occasional? And do I have to do a lot of digging to find the answer to that? Um, you don't. <laughs> One thing we uh, did there was we made it very clear. What we said was uh, you, there's a safe harbor, first of all, if you are talking about use of, of the organization's facilities for a, a time period that would be uh, basically less than four hours worth per month. Um, you're, you're within a safe harbor. But beyond that, the rule is an amount of usage that would not interfere with that employee's ability to carry out their normal work functions. That's the underlying rule. So it's a fairly broadly stated rule, but that's how we would measure. Who came up with the four hours? How would you arrive at that number? That would be commissioners that were there before me. I, uh, I don't remember who, who pushed that or how that sort of that standard emerged, but it's been there a long time. I see Commissioner Smith back there. He's laughing as well. <laughs> I don't think he knows. I don't know. Well, I don't. If, I could, if I could slightly change the question and, and pose a hypothetical I've been trying to figure out for the last, it's not a hypothetical, pose a situation that I've been trying to figure out for the last couple of weeks or last week. Um, I, we have a blogger, Larry Lessig, one of the, you know, one of those high-powered lawyers we were talking about earlier, um, employed by Stanford Law School. I, one of the things that Stanford wants Larry Lessig to do is to think important thoughts and express those thoughts in important places. And and now one of the important places that Larry spends a lot of time expressing his important thoughts is his own blog. And so if you asked the Stanford Corporation 
whether Larry Lessig's blogging is furthering a corporate goal, a corporate interest of spreading ideas, I think Stanford would, would say absolutely, we want him to be aggressively and actively blogging. But then does that mean that he can't say anything about a political election issue? It's a huge question, and I don't have a good answer for it. Um, and I, I realize I'm, I'm kind of looking at Chairman Thomas, and, 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 and I have to <laughs> acknowledge that, that it's not necessarily Chair, Chairman Thomas's problem uh, or fault, but in that, in that you know, a lot of this goes back to the underlying statutes. And, and so, I mean, there may well be some parts of the problem that the Internet raises that, that can't be solved by the Commission but may need to be solved by Congress. Okay, I, I have one more question, uh, and I don't see, I do, oh, I do see someone. Blogging matures.